Good afternoon, folks. How are you? Welcome. So this is manifesting the next generation of sustainability in education and the world. Student perspectives. It's a panel. And the way it's going to work is something like this. We're going to have an, uh, an opening statement. We're going to have some the panelists introduce themselves. And then we'll have a discussion. And then the fun stuff, we open it up for conversation. How does that engagement happen? To help us plumb these deep and murky waters, we have a panel of folks, current students and recent graduates, who are going to look at the topics of this conference from the student perspectives. They are Jordan Thomas, Princeton University, Kathleen Parrish, Rutgers alumna, Jamila Ritter, Rutgers, Joanna Contario, Rowan, and Annalise Dyer, FDU, Fairly Dickinson University. Sorry. So the way it's going to work is Jordan's going to kick it off. He gets five minutes to introduce himself and make his opening remarks. Then the panelists introduce themselves, two minutes each, uh, background, what they have done so far, what they're doing now, what makes them passionate about sustainability, that kind of stuff, two minutes each. And then we'll go to discussion about 40 minutes or so with four questions, which I'll get to later. I don't want to overburden the, the memory cells. So Jordan, you ready to take it away? I am. If you have slides, share them, otherwise start. I do not have slides. Uh, Excellent. But I, I thank you, Ashwani. I thank you, Jenna. Uh, really, everyone here uh, who's helped organize and bring together this incredible group. I've been honored to have met my fellow panelists here and am just so impressed and so inspired, really, by the work that everyone is doing and the way that you really are. Uh, in the spirit of, of this entire conference and thinking about sustainability, you are applying it in your daily, your daily lives and your work. And so I'm just so, uh, so thankful to be a part of this and uh, I'm grateful for having been invited. Uh, personally, I'm working as chief of staff now to the uh, global philanthropist Ray Chambers uh, at his uh, family foundation, the MCJ Amelia Foundation. I've been on the team formally now as chief of staff for only eight months, <laughs> but I've actually been in the orbit and have worked on and off on uh, several projects uh, with the foundation and then broadly with the city of Newark really over the course of the last two years. And so it's been a wonderful opportunity. And I believe that why I was invited in this case is because I'm somebody who believes very strongly from my time having worked at a, at a foundation and having been so involved also at the city level in this concept of tri-sector collaboration and tri-sector leadership, right? That it's not only the government or even the nonprofit sector's role to engage in certain critical social, environmental, economic issues, but that the private sector plays a very significant role in that as well. And I believed in it so much that uh, I've actually signed on to uh, a JD MBA at Yale Law School and Harvard Business School because I believe that we need to have leaders critically thinking about how to integrate across sectors uh, and, and addressing critical issues. And so I just wanna start this panel with a, a broader sort of discussion around what it is that we're, we're discussing here today, which is it's sustainable business education and practice and how do you integrate concepts of sustainability for what has been somewhat of a inertia laden <laughs> field uh, in business education, but we are seeing change. And I think that this is such an important issue because we see the task ahead of us is large. Uh, we think about the sustainable development goals and uh, what was set back in 2015, a set of 17 goals around environment, uh, workplace, uh, economics, gender equality, education, et cetera, uh, to be reached by 2030. And the, the clock is ticking. Uh, and it, it's really about thinking about how do we mobilize a coalition of leaders and industries um, and, and start to make progress toward the outcomes that, that we envisioned back when this was set in 2015. And so again, I go back to how do you tackle such a, a large goal, uh, a large set of goals, let me say, and it's such a, 
uh, behemoth task of us. And I think that you need every single player to the table. And you need to make sure that everybody who has capacity is properly doing their part and making a difference. And so I look at the private sector and the private sector is a $19 trillion set of entities, right? That is four times the size of government. And that is 40 times the size of private philanthropy. And so to think that we can do this only through nonprofit social initiatives uh, or economic initiatives, only through government stimulus, et cetera, is, is just not true. We need everybody to play their part. And then I think about how we, how we start to inspire a future generation that thinks actively about that and not reactively about that is it needs to start in the classroom. And so I was extremely uh, inspired when I was asked to sit on this panel and I was uh, just having an opportunity to discuss what's happening at the Rutgers Institute for Corporate Social Innovation because it is in every way thinking critically about how do we train this future generation of business leaders through exposure to different industries, through um, different social causes, and then inspiring them to think about what is necessary, what uh, partnerships, collaborations need to be formed in order to address those, those issues. It really is a bottom-up approach to cultivating this network of, of really inspiring individuals who in every step of how they think about business are simultaneously thinking about sustainability. And that's how you, I think, actually make progress toward achieving the 2030 SDGs or whatever uh, goals get set uh, henceforth. It's not by looking at what's been done in the past and saying, okay, here we go. Let's all of a sudden just pivot because there is, there's inertia in business. There's, there are these big players in the tech space, big players um, in, um, in, in every industry really that have a certain way of doing things. And I think it needs to start from the bottom up in the future generation. You need to have it be one and the same. As you think about business, you think about sustainability. So I'm extremely inspired with what Rixie's doing. There are a number of other schools doing it as well. Stanford actually had the first uh, Center for Social Innovation started at a major North American business school, Harvard, uh, Northwestern, U Chicago, and many others have followed. But again, I'm extremely impressed and particularly excited about Rutgers is doing. Um, and so I'm extremely happy to be a part of it. And uh, just seeing that we have this right here in my home city of Newark, being born and raised there is what excites me most because uh, I've been working really day day in and day out since uh, the start of the pandemic on the COVID-19 task force. And I've seen how it's been this incredible mobilization of, again, the nonprofit sector. We have family foundations like the one that I'm affiliated with and a number of others who have stepped up to the plate on COVID. Uh, we have a number of businesses in Newark getting involved, everything from Audible to Panasonic to Prudential is getting involved on the COVID response. And then of course, the city of Newark itself and the Department of Health, Public Safety, et cetera. So what I've seen just in response to COVID is tremendously inspiring and it is a case in point example of the type of tri-sector collaboration that is necessary to achieve any goal and affect impact in relation to any cause. It just so happens that 2020 has given us the mother of all causes in uh, in civil unrest around racial injustice, around um, you know a, a climate change, around the election now, and voter suppression and voter uh, empowerment, and then of course around the pandemic. So 2020 has given us a perfect storm. But again, I'm inspired just from what I've seen happening in Newark on, as a microcosm of what broadly needs to happen across the world and how you bring all these different parties, all these different groups to the table to achieve an outcome. So I've spoken far too much already and the other panelists alongside me have many, many exciting thoughts and initiatives that they're a part of. But again, I just wanna thank you all for having me and am just so impressed with what Rixie's doing and, and I'm so excited about this panel. Well done, well done. So I was just on a webinar with John Elkington, who wrote uh, Green Swans. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. The Coming Boom in Regenerative Capitalism. He talks a lot about disruption and the coming disruptions that we're going to see. And that's really a point, I think, uh, Jordan, that speaks to what you were talking about, that the innovations that we're seeing on the ground today are the things that are going to buffer us from the disruptions that are going to come at us head and foot before we know it. So thank you for that. Very nicely done. Uh, so 
Kathleen, Jamila, Joanna, Annalise, uh, two minutes each, your backgrounds, what have you done? Where are you now? What makes you passionate about sustainability? Kathleen, you want to take it first? Sounds great. Thank you both for it. I'm sorry. Thank you both for the incredible um, introductions to the panel. Um, almost makes me want to jump ship from the public sector. Um, does sound pretty exciting. Um, so I guess if I want to start with um, what I've done, um, I think when I first got to Rutgers as a student, um, well, you often hear about universities themselves being siloed. I think my interests were siloed at first, so separately interested in social justice and in environmentalism, in health, and all these other different issues. Um, and the more that I got involved at Rutgers with our environmental organization and got started helping to organize these conferences around sustainability and eventually the sustainable development goals, I realized, wow, this is all actually connected. And when you address things in an interconnected way in the way that the sustainable development goals really encourage us to do, you make so much more progress. So that just kind of got me really passionate about the intersection of environmental, social and economic sustainability and kind of looking at things holistically. And then took another look at Rutgers and even at the work that our student organizations were doing and realized that, again, things were siloed. So um, brought together student organizations at Rutgers that were working on all those different sectors of sustainability as the Rutgers Sustainability Coalition. This is based in the New Brunswick campus. And together, we continued to organize these conferences, helped to bring them to all three campuses of Rutgers. Newark, Camden, and New Brunswick, and ended up developing a proposal for the Rutgers Office of Sustainability and Engagement. Um, an idea, a proposal that would help to bring together all these different campuses of Rutgers and really coordinate and empower further change through what was already going on. There were already amazing students, professors, and everybody from all different corner of all the different corners of Rutgers and our community that were working on incredible projects that could just work together. So that was the idea. Um, there's still people working on it. And I think Rutgers is working on a climate action plan now, which is really exciting. Um, so since graduating, um, I've actually moved on to working for the National Council for Science and the Environment. Um, they're working with universities across the country and they're starting to go global now um, to come together around science policy issues and environmental issues and sustainability. So I'm helping them with organizing their conference. And I'm also working for the Energy Foundation in New Jersey on New Jersey policy around sustainability and energy and helping um, facilitate and to support their coalition of nonprofits, business organizations, and other groups that are representing business organizations. Um, and I guess why I'm so passionate about sustainability, it's our future and it gives me hope in a time that's just so, so 2020. <laughs> that's a good way to put it. That's a very good way to put it. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, interesting place to be. Jamila, you want to take it away? Sure. So my name is Jamila. I'm a senior at RBS and I'm actually studying supply chain and management information systems. So. Um, I've kind of always been interested in kind of what we can do to make things better for others. Um, that's something that I've, I've always done. And so, um, but kind of as Kathleen has said, it's always been siloed. So it's never been something that's part of, of what I do for work or part of what I do for school. It's always been something that's separate. And last year I had the um, kind of privilege to be an honoree for the collective impact for the global goal goals, which is a program that Rutgers put on. And basically that gave me a chance to partner with a business and try to figure out how can we focus on, you know, we're, we're gonna focus on this uh, SDG goal and try to get, um, kind of get our ourselves and, and the business looking at what we can do to push forward that goal. Right. So the goals that we kind of looked at were um, decent work and economic growth. And it was basically um, engaging youth in manufacturing. So manufacturing, when people think about it, it's a dying industry. 
Um, but really and truly, it's an industry that's led to a lot of the innovation that we see in the world today. And there's still a lot going on in manufacturing. And that's one of the things that we aim to do. So how do we get young people engaged in manufacturing? How do we get them to think of manufacturing in a way that's not, you know, the Ford assembly line where they have to sit in these hot um, kind of warehouses and, you know, be overworked and, you know, how do we get them to think that it's cool and something that they want to be part of? And that's a project that we worked on and we still continue to work on today. Um, and, and that's kind of the path that led me to, um, to where I am right now. And I'm actually on the student advisory board for Rixie as well. Thank you. Well done. Joanna? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Joanna Contarino. I'm a senior at Rowan University. I'm studying environmental and sustainability studies, so it's a very broad topic, um, which excites me because everything we've been talking about already, um, it's such a broad topic, you know, environmental sustainability and sustainability in general. Um, so even like just, you know, yesterday I was on a call with um, some students that I was mentoring that are starting a project over at TCNJ. And you know, one was a psychology major, one was um, in the business school, and another one was doing, um, well, I guess she's in the business school as well, international affairs. Um, so it's just really exciting for me when I see like different people um, or different students with like different backgrounds and different majors than just environmental, um, starting like a environmentally focused grassroots organization. Um, and yeah, so the other work that I do is, you know, at on campus, I'm part of the Rowan Environmental Action League, which is the um, advocacy and activist group on campus, um, trying to, you know, uh, cut out single use plastics, work on a car, uh, climate action plan that we have a bunch of petition signatures for. Um, and then statewide, I'm the co-chair of the New Jersey Student Sustainability Coalition. So that is basically a network of students, high school and college. Uh, we get together to share resources, um, expertise, and um, you know, push for uh, environmental sustainability policies. So we work on the plastic bill that most definitely will be signed soon, we think, from the um, by the governor. Um, we're working right now on the Clean Energy Equity Act, which is an environmental justice bill that would give like $50 million annually to um, communities that are overburdened in New Jersey, which is a lot of communities in New Jersey, unfortunately. Um, but those are just some of the stuff that we're working on. And then we also have a lot of like training opportunities. And I really just, most of my work focuses on building new leaders in the environmental movement and making sure that people realize that no matter what background they're coming from or major they're studying, that there's a place for them in the environmental movement. Excellent. Cutting edge stuff, good for you. Uh, Annalise? Hi everyone, I'm Annalise Dyer. I go to Fairleigh Dickinson University. I study accounting and I minor in sustainability management. So when I first got to Fairleigh Dickinson, I found myself in a business school where everyone believed that the only route to work in sustainability was to find a sustainable company that wanted an accountant. And I got into a sustainability program and I was thinking about this and I went, there's gotta be more that I could do. I was doing taxes in Wyndham, which is believed to be a very sustainable company. And I thought, I just, I know that there's more I can be doing to help the cause. So the next summer I went out and I was working with the PSEG Institute for Sustainability Studies. I got the opportunity to study renewable natural gas and create a whole market in New Jersey for a utility company. And it was all the way from the bottom up. There was nothing before that research. And it was interesting to watch how somebody who studied business could find a sustainable solution to implement in our state and make a difference. So I knew that that was where I wanted to go. There was more to accounting than just becoming a CPA. So I think that this whole idea that you're gonna study business and you're gonna follow the same path as everyone, it just isn't true. You can go out and you can work with all the things that you're passionate about. You can study these topics that will help you along the way and accounting is definitely going to help me with this. I have such a competitive edge by learning in a business school environment and taking what I know about business and implementing it in sustainability where 
a lot of people are here to help and they come in with an environmental perspective and I want to figure out how can we use all of these great things that we all know and make it profitable and make people want to engage in this. So since then, I'm currently working on getting my research published in a Swiss journal called uh, Sustainability. And I will be completing my master's by the end of next year. But I will always be passionate about sustainability no matter what I'm studying. Excellent. I think that's the biggest thing that the, the five of you bring to the table is your, your keen minds and your passion for this work. And I think you've demonstrated very clearly already in these two minutes blurbs, uh, how savvy you, you are about all of this. So let's go to the next portion of our session. We are now at 4.58, right on time. So there are four questions that I wanted to ask you folks. And I don't want to ask them one at a time. Do you mind if I just read through them and then we have a conversation around them? Is that all right with you? Would you prefer I ask you one question at a time? By all means, if you'd like to ask all at once, that's fine. You have copies of the questions, so you should be able to access them. So here are the four questions that I had in my mind for, for you folks. I've been a professor for many years. I'm jaded and I am siloed in spite of all my transdisciplinary work. And I want to hear what you have to say about these things. So about sustainability in general, it's the first question. The second question is, how is it taught at your university? Is it a siloed approach? Is there opportunity for transdisciplinary work? How does it actually happen? And how do you talk about and teach about sustainability in the business school, your business school? Third, I want to talk about taking it out in the world, embracing sustainability in the real world of career development, sustainability. Thanks, Ashwani. Those are, are great questions. And I guess I'll kick us off here. Um, in regards to how I think about sustainability, I, I like to take a broad approach because I feel like often we, we do have this siloed way of thinking about it. And it seems like really often the conversation around sustainability, I think almost automatically, and for good reason, um, starts to focus on climate sustainability and countering and combating climate change. And again, I said for good reason, because we are living in the most dire and existentially threatening climate crisis of our lives. And so I'm, I'm glad that we are starting to think critically around how businesses and individuals in general can start playing their part in, in at least trying to reduce um, carbon emissions and things of that sort. But when I think about sustainability, I like to think about it in a broader sense of what are the general business practices, if we're referring to a, a corporate entity, or just in general, actions that even individuals can take that are related to creating a more sustainable and equitable world, right? So that's when I start thinking not just about climate issues, but also around other social issues, other areas of injustice in, in terms of race or culture or religion. I start thinking about educational access and justice. And so uh, this is why I personally am really passionate about one of our partner organizations in my work is uh, Just Capital. It's a nonprofit business ranking and research organization, which actually assigns ratings to businesses based on how they, how they stack up when you actually look at their practices in regards to a number of, of issue areas. And when you look at these Just Cause issue areas, just to read you a few here, we look at things like paying a fair livable wage to their employees, upholding human rights across the supply chain, 
uh, investing in workforce training, uh, acting ethically at the leadership level, not taking uh, funds or backdoor deals and things of that sort, Cul cultivating a diverse and inclusive workplace, right? That's sustainable business. You cannot actually have a business that that is a future forward facing business if you're not actually representative of the broader social uh, demographic in which you're operating, right? So even just diversity and inclusion, which I'm particularly passionate about, I think is a sustainable business practice. So I think very broadly beyond the sort of typical uh, environmental way of thinking about it, but I, I would love to hear what my fellow panelists think. Excellent, excellent. And I think you answered my original question of how we should play this panel. Kathleen, you want to take this one next? Sure. So. Well, of course, everything that Jordan said, and I think to kind of put that in my own words and something that really is central to how I think about climate and sustainability is that if we save the planet, who are we saving it for? Um, I don't think there's like, if we're not here, the planet will go on, it'll be fine. Um, what we need to do is not only save the planet, but save the people on it and make sure that the people on it are prospering and able to have opportunities and to enjoy what our lives. Um, and I think just every aspect of the sustainable development goals kind of feeds into that, um, whether it's gender inequality, racial inequality, economic inequality, just things like that. And when we start to address all of these issues together, we can actually create more opportunities, whether it's job opportunities, health opportunities, because in terms of our emissions, it's not just carbon, it's also um, emissions from diesel that are really impacting our health and disproportionately impacting our health because it's mostly the middle class, upper class, mostly white communities are fine. They don't get the power plants. They don't get the ports and the trucks and they get to be okay and breathe clean air. And we need to address that. And I think sustainability is just that, making sure that we have a planet and we have a planet for people and the people can be successful on that planet. Excellent, well put. Jamila, you want to take a crack at this? How do you think about sustainability? Sure. So um, the way that I think about sustainability is I, I really think that sustainability is for everyone. It's something, it's everywhere and it's something that everyone should take up as their mission to um, kind of be a champion for, right? So that's, that's kind of how I feel about sustainability and to kind of tie in a little bit to what Jordan said. Um, when he was talking about the businesses and how they rank the businesses, um, one of the really cool things that we did, and this is going to tap into one of your other questions a little bit, but one of the things that Rutgers does that I really love is we do this uh, aim to flourish um, initiative, right? So all the students have to take part in this initiative. And what it is, is basically you look at companies and you look at them through the, um, you use appreciative inquiry and also the SDG goals to kind of like frame, how are we going to, or what does this company do well? What are the things they can do to improve on what they're currently doing in terms of sustainability, right? And you go through this whole process and what you're allowed to do is change the way that you think about sustainability and business. And it gives you a chance to see how it all works together. And that's something that I really, really like being a part of. And we did, um, kind of the piece that we did was published on the Aim to Flourish site. Um, so that was, that was really great. And I think that's something that every university should take part in if they can. And so when, when I think of sustainability, I think of kind of everyone coming together and figuring out how we can solve the problems that most of the time we created ourselves, right? So, so kind of those are, those are my thoughts there. Thank you. Thank you. Annalise, bring it home. So, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> My eyes skipped. Joanna. Sure. Um, yeah, so I want to mimic everything that all the other panelists had just said, for sure. Um, I think where I think about it differently, we're not even really differently, but put it in different words, is um, I look at it as like a mindset and a tool. So something like sustainability shouldn't be 
it should just be like a mindset that we all have for every single aspect of our lives, I think. Um, so even if you look at it, like I look at everything kind of like as a movement building thing, because that's what I like to do. I like to build coalitions and movements and make sure that we're all kind of working together with our different skills. Um, I look at it as like sustaining our work for the next generation. Um, so teaching, you know, those younger than us, making sure that we're bringing people up the ladder, um, not leaving people out of the conversations that are really important just because they're too young to understand or whatever you think um, your mindset is. But I really think that creating like um, a cross generational and intergenerational uh, movement is really important. And I think that's kind of how I look at sustainability. Um, yeah, that's what I would add. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, Annalise, bring it home. So very similarly to what Jamila was saying, I feel really strongly that sustainability affects more than just those who study and work with it. It's in every single facet of our business. Like every single day I wake up and think about sustainability, but everyone around us should also wake up every day and think about sustainability. The climate, the climate crisis is still happening. It's happening everywhere. We look at these major storms that hit us every day, the fires in California. This is a problem right now. And the fact that the only people that wake up every day and think about it are those that study and already work in it. We're not going to grow and change. The businesses aren't going to grow into a sustainable business if we don't get someone in there. So I always think of it as, yeah, we could all work at these sustainable companies and we can all go out and study at schools that teach sustainability or we could go out and we can turn these companies that aren't sustainable yet into a sustainable company. We can go to these schools who aren't teaching sustainability and we can make them teach sustainability. Business schools really need to be teaching this because they are the future business leaders of America. They need to go out there and they need to teach them how to change their product lines from these toxic ways and all of these ways that hurt our planet and hurt the people working there as well. It's not just about the planet, it is about the social aspect as well. So we have to go out there and we have to be in every single place, not just the places we're already in. And that's just really how I feel about it. It's a good way to feel. It's a good way to feel. Okay, so how is it taught at your university? How do you talk about and teach about sustainability in your business school? Does it matter? Jordan? It does matter. Uh, that's the that's the fundamental principle, I think, for why we're even having this panel is because it, it is such an important piece of business education these days. And, and for schools where it's not, I hope that it soon will be. So it definitely matters. Uh, what they're doing at Harvard, I think, is fascinating because they're really starting to welcome in, interdisciplinary thinking around sustainability, which is part of why I'm so passionate about taking that approach. I think that Harvard recognizes that the private sector works as one very important piece of a larger puzzle. But again, I go back to this concept of cross-sector collaboration and not operating in a silo. Even the private sector alone with $19 trillion can't do it on its, uh, by itself, right? And public pri uh, private partnerships are key examples in that. Often you need the private sector to even if they have a vision to, in some capacity, work alongside governments for contracts or uh, for legislative changes and, and things of that sort. So uh, the, what Harvard's doing that I think is really fascinating, and it's one of its more recent uh, additions, is it's actually now allowing joint degrees between the business school and the, um, the School of Engineering and applied sciences. And that's the latest joint degree expansion that it's made. But, you know, for instance, like I said, my joint degree is between the law school and the business school. So they've already thought a lot about policy and legal intersections with business. You look a lot, that's actually a, a pretty emerging field because a lot of, if you just look at some of the latest startups that are raising capital and have high valuations, a lot of startups, funny enough, are actually really disruptive tech companies in the legal space. So almost like a Stripe that's facilitating online business transactions and things of that sort, business to business, but amongst law firms um, and things that are just facilitating legal review processes and, and uh, correspondences between firms, things like that. So legal tech has become a big piece, which is why I think business school and law school joint degrees make sense. But anyway, going back to the latest piece at Harvard is I think that this engineering and applied science and business joint degree is really exciting because it just shows that Harvard's really thinking a lot about it's not the business 
education alone, but it's thinking about business in an applied sense alongside some sort of focus, focus issue area. And I think that just given what we've discussed so far around climate and tech and all of these other science related fields that this concept of engineering, the joint engineering business degree, I think will become ever more popular and ever more common in other business schools. I really do think that that's going to be as common, if not more so, five, 10 years from now as the classic JD MBA. Thank you. Thank you. Cogent. Kathleen? So I may be the odd one out here. I did not go to business school. Um, I was actually a microbiology major and uh, did research in engineering and microplastics that coincided with sustainability. And then in my extracurriculars and my experience was really where I got involved in sustainability and did most of my learning through hands-on projects and through partnerships. So I learned about business and sustainability by working with professors like Gina Wurtenberg, who's on the line and helped organize this conference. Um, I think at Rutgers, in terms of learning about sustainability, we have a sustainability minor, we have classes that incorporate it. So if you're looking for sustainability and opportunities to learn about it, you'll find it, but it won't necessarily find you. So if you're not somebody who's coming to the school, already interested in it, and whether it's in sustainability or environmentalism or in social justice, you might not find it. You might not learn about that approach. You might not learn about that lens to your work, especially if your field isn't adjacent to it. But we need people in all fields to have people bring sustainability to them and give them projects and ideas to work on and learn by doing using the skills from their field, in my opinion. Nicely done, nicely done. Jamila? Yes, I definitely agree with that, um, Katie. And I will say a lot of the times, at least what I found, is if I didn't go out looking for certain things, I would never know about the opportunities or the things that we are, we're offered. Um, so you really do need to be proactive. But I think one of the things that RBS, so the Rutgers Business School does, um, so I mentioned the um, in the management skills class that I took, which is a core requirement, we did that Aim to Flourish project. But there are other, um, there are other things that they do in other classes that I really appreciated too. So for example, business ethics, so that's kind of related, but in business ethics, you had to kind of come up with a green company that would make a profit, but was also sustainable. And that was a, a project that I think when you sat and listened to all the different innovations that people came up with was really amazing, right? So you have a class of 50 people and everyone came up with a different solution, which was really cool. Um, we also do have like an introduction to corporate social responsibility, which actually Gina is starting in his is teaching this semester for undergraduates. Um, so there, there are a lot of things that at least Rutgers is doing to try to push it forward and kind of get it in front of all of us as future leaders. Because and I think that's really important because we are the people who are going to be the next CEOs, the next CEOs, the next set of the next generation of leaders that are making these decisions and if it's in our minds now and we learn how to connect the dots in the future it will only make it better for everyone else so you know that's, that's my thoughts thank you so tell me there's reason for hope we have a light and we're not even in the tunnel joanna Yes, I'm also not a business student, but um, there are some cool things that Rowan is doing in the business school. Um, one thing is they do have an MBA program where it's a sustainability, um, you get like a sustainability BA and then like your MBA, it's like a four plus one program uh, that they just started. So that's really cool. Um, but a lot of the stuff at Rowan has to be like everyone else is saying like supplemented by like other things. So they have like a center for responsible leadership, uh, which teaches about um, or has programs on all kinds of like environmental stuff, um, social issues and stuff that you can incorporate into a business. Um, so again, you have to seek it out like everyone else is saying a lot of this stuff. Um, but they do have like some, you know, things that they're working towards. I know that in all of the new books, I was talking to the, um, the uh, head of the business school, the, all the new books for the business school, like they, they have things about corporate social responsibility and environmental sustainability, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's taught in the classroom, but it is in the books. Um, so that's kind of like a step forward. 
I know one thing that I like um, have done a lot of research on is like worker cooperatives and how they can be a lot more successful for a lot of the things we're talking about for worker rights, um, environmental sustainability and that kind of stuff. Um, that is what I want to see business school shift towards. Um, you know, I'm not a business student, but that is kind of what I kind of see as the future of business is, you know, having a better foundation and different values for us to like set up as, as like, you know, more people having access to business and, and like have meaningful work, I think is really important. Um, and I know that there was a, um, a carbon neutrality plan that Rowan had signed and adopted like in the early 2000s. Um, and unfortunately they just didn't do anything with it, but they were planning on incorporating sustainability into the curriculum. So they had planned on having like a sustainability like class for each major, which would be really exciting. And I think that, you know, that's something I wanna push for in my last two months at, uh, there, but it is something I'm working towards getting, you know, them to put onto paper again. I think it's really important to have that cross-disciplinary approach for sure. Excellent, excellent. Annalise? So I don't believe that there's enough being done in business schools. There are a lot of core classes that we all have to take as business majors. And for five minutes in the whole semester, we might discuss sustainability. And none of the other classes know that this is happening in the other classes. So you'll say, oh yeah, I've heard about this in another class. And the others will be like, oh, what, what? you've heard about this? Like they didn't know that because we don't have a large sustainability following. There's probably less than a dozen of us in the sustainability program we do have. And it's just not being built enough. We need more support for this. And it needs to be in every class and not just a five minute, hey, here's sustainable development goals. It needs to be, these are the things that you can do as a business leader in the future that you should be proactively learning right now. You shouldn't be thinking about raw materials as disposable. You should be thinking, this is something I should use to the fullest and reduce my waste as much as possible. It's still being taught in our finance classes that maximized shareholder wealth is the business model we should be following. And that is just not true. We don't need to be following maximized shareholder wealth. We need to be following, let's survive the climate crisis we're living in right now. So all of us are learning that we should put the shareholder first, but not to proactively build a better environment for our, our whole community. All of those that are involved from the shareholders to the employees, to our customers we should be learning this kind of model and we just are not. Mm. Okay. Which really, in a sense, brings us to a place where we can begin to bring this conversation in to a tighter place. Uh, so building on what Annalise just said, there's what, you, what happens in the business school there's what you do in your own personal lives. And then you finish with business school and you go out into the real world. Well, sorry, I shouldn't say that. You go out into the world, embracing sustainability in the real world of career development. I want to combine that thought with what's to be done. So in a Janus-faced kind of way, as you leave the business school and transition into your career lives, what can you do looking backwards to make sure the business school practices change as well? Do you want to take a crack at that, Jordan? Sure, and I think that's a great question because I think that there is this, and I love how you, you change the phrasing of real world to just out into the world. Uh, because I, I do believe that even when you're in school, you're fulfilling a certain purpose and working towards certain ends that are advancing value in the, the broader spectrum of, of whatever issues you care about. I don't think that there's this strict sort of 
contrast between what I can do when I'm in school and then all of a sudden you graduate and you become this drastically different person who's empowered? No, you were <laughs> equally powerful and important and impactful when you were still a student. So I think that student activism and engagement are really important. All of that is to say, I think that once you do graduate, however, how you still give back to the school that you were a part of or just broader business education is, I think panels like this are really important. Um, making sure that you you are still active in the broader discussion around how business education should be structured, because you, particularly to Annalise's point, as a sustainability focused, ESG driven, mission driven uh, business student are, or let me say in that case, business graduate are still kind of unusual and it's unfortunate, but it's true. And so I think that to the extent that you can still find yourself in spaces in which you are lending your insight and somewhat acting as an advisor or just a commentator of any sort is important because you bring a perspective that on a panel, unless it's a panel like this, which is specifically talking about sustainable business, generally just a panel around business education may not have that sustainable voice. So I think that actually placing yourself in the room, so to speak, is really important. I think the other thing is, is reaching out and serving as a mentor uh, uh, is really important. So I believe strongly in mentorship and uh, in just having conversations with students who are looking at business schools. I do the same thing for students who are looking at law schools. Uh, and then I do the same thing for students who are passionate about a certain mission or cause, but are unsure of how to achieve their ends related to that mission or cause, such that I've had people call me and they say, I see what you're doing in some of the work with this foundation or some of my other projects. And they say, I'm really passionate about mental health, but I don't know how to insert myself in the mental health impact space. Do you have any thoughts? And I think that that's an area where you are actually a critical activist and leader in driving people and changing the narratives around business education. Because you may say to that person, wow, okay, that's wonderful that you're so passionate about mental health and impact in that space. Have you thought about doing maybe a, a social impact? A project uh, related to servicing the needs of, of individuals who are struggling with mental health in under-resourced areas, right? That's a really common uh, way to, I think, think about changing the narrative of business school is some people think you go to business school, again, to just learn about finance and share, uh, shareholder value, like Annalise said, but I also think a really cool opportunity in business school is to just learn about business practices that you can apply to social causes. And that's why I think social entrepreneurship is awesome. So I think that just guiding people toward business school who seem like untraditional business school candidates, but in this era of sustainable business might actually be the business leaders of tomorrow is another really important role that we can play. So mentorship is really important. Excellent. Very well put. So Kathleen, you want to take that? I completely agree about um, school and colleges and universities being the real world and you being able to have a very real impact while you're there. I think that's an incredible way to get started and to learn and not just within your university community, but your university or college or high school is probably in a town or in a city and you can get involved locally there too and make a difference. Um, I actually got started in environmentalism, joining my town's environmental commission. And then when I got to Rutgers, got it more interested in environmentalism. And as I mentioned before, ended up working um, on different conferences and towards an office of sustainability. And then from there, um, I, I will admit that the initial transition out of college is difficult. That's a whole nother conversation. But the foundation that I laid in terms of learning through experiences before and the people that I met helped me with that transition and helped me to get to where I am now, where I'm working with these two fantastic organizations and doing work that I'm interested in. And um, for the most part, it is still entry level work, but I'm meeting people, I'm learning things from the people that I'm around and kind of figuring out what path I'm going to take next and how I'm best going to make my impact. And I think just recognizing that we each have skills and you can hone those skills by doing things, you can hone those skills in classes and in order to figure out what you want to do and how you're going to make your impact in sustainability in your field, you just kind of have to start doing things and try it out and see what happens and Sometimes things won't work out and sometimes they will and go from there. Good point and a good attitude. 
Jamila, you want to take it? I definitely like the attitude, Katie. Um, so I would say, you know, I like that you, you rewarded um, and did say like the real world is where we are right now because I am still in college and kind of how I kind of think about sustainability in my, my world is I'm the president of a supply chain club, right? And what that means to me is that gives me a platform to push forward the sustainability initiatives that I started working on in the program, um, in the collective impact um, program, right? So what I use my platform to do is to educate people in manufacturing, educate people in how we can just make tiny steps, right? So tiny ripples make bigger waves. And so that's how I try to take um, sustainability into the real world for myself. When I think about life after college, one of the things that um, was big on my list of where am I gonna work after I graduate? Where am I gonna make my home? Where am I gonna start my career? I had a lot of sustainability things on that list. A lot of um, things that focused around corporate um, social responsibility and how the company that I would land at approached the world. Right? How do they care about the people that they service if it was a company that serviced consumers? And so those are the types of things that I think that, that I thought about. And it's something that people don't necessarily think about initially. And what I feel like is important is if we get people to start thinking in those terms, it will force businesses, force governments, force all these big institutions and organizations to reshape the way that they're doing things. Um, to Jordan's point, mentorship is important, right? So when people reach out to me and they ask me questions about things that I've done, I always bring about the social, um, the uh, sustainability aspect of it, right? So if you're asking me a question about how I got into this internship, this is the internship that I got into. And these are the reasons why I chose this company to apply to. And this is how you know, the sustainable things that they're doing and the reasons why I really was passionate about working there. So things like that. So I think hearing from people, um, and I think that's part of where representation matters, right? Because if you see someone and you kind of look up to them and you feel like you like what they're doing and you want to hear more about them and those people are kind of bringing those facts, talking about sustainability, talking about things that they could do, it, it makes a difference for the people asking the questions and it makes them think differently. Good point. Good point. Well done. Joanna? Great. Thank you, Jamil, for that. I, I also agree with that, that mindset of like looking at the top and the values that people in companies hold. Um, so like the idea of looking upstream. So uh, when I think about it, like I'm thinking more of like the economic system in, in, in whole, right? So um, one project I did once was looking at like GDP and like alternatives to GDP. Um, because like right now we're addicted to growth and the growth model and you know not everything in GDP is a good thing for public health or workers rights or whatever issue we want to look at of course environmental sustainability right um, and so you know there's things like the uh, the GPI like the gross progressive index or whatever that includes like access to healthcare and like these kind of things um, but, but really it is like that whole conversation is like a, a, a shift in values and like what we value in our economic system. Um, you know, the, the work that I've done and the research that I've done in this, this field, um, you know, makes me a little pessimistic, I guess, because I think that there's a lot of greenwashing going on. Um, some of the, uh, the papers that I've read, you know, the first thing to go in any corporate plan is like a sustainability plan, like as soon as the bottom line is getting impacted. Um, so there's stuff like that. I mean, there's also like um, a paper that showed that once we found out like how um, energy efficient like LED light bulbs were, that we decided we were going to put LED light bulbs on everything and anything that we could put them on, even though lights were never on certain things. So it's like this idea that humans like you know, once we find out something's sustainable, we kind of think that we can use it to excess. Um, so I think that that growth model is like the most important thing to change and our, our like addiction to growth um, is really important to, sh to change that shift. I don't know exactly how to do it. Um, I know there's a lot of people that are doing work on it. Um, I just got a book in the mail about degrowth. So maybe, you know, in a month or two, I can tell you more. <laughs>
Excellent. I'm so glad these talks are being recorded. This is an excellent resource. Annalise? So, basing off of what Joanna just said and how the bottom line is what's determining all of this, they will save money in the long run if they switch to these sustainable practices. If you just eliminate your waste, reduce your energy, all of these things are things that will ultimately save you money. Being green is one of the things that can help you in the long run. They've shown in studies that companies that switch to renewable and sustainable practices eventually have higher returns and they do well over year over year in the stock market. I think a lot of companies are very intimidated to go into sustainability and they fear the changes that they will have to make because they are so dramatic. But if you make those changes now, you will only be setting yourself up for success in the long run. If you convert your raw materials now to a sustainable solution, you won't have to deal with scarcity in the future when all of the raw material materials that we're using right now in excess start to become scarce and we're running out of them, you will have already set yourself up to have an alternative. And when your energy bills start skyrocketing because you relied on fossil fuels, you will have already set yourself up for a renewable alternative. You will have the competitive edge if you set yourself up with sustainability. And everyone on this panel is walking into their future career knowing these kinds of advantages. And the people that learn these things in business schools are going into the whole career world knowing that they have this edge because they know what it means to be sustainable. Very nicely done. Very nicely done. So to close it all out, what, what's to be done? So given all that you've said, and you've said a lot of wonderful things, you've laid out a really great strategy for moving this thing forward. What can folks do here and now today to change this state of things and make it more so? All the things you said should happen, how do we make them happen? I think that it starts with looking at where we are, what the gaps are in the field or industry in which we find ourselves, and thinking about how we're specially positioned already to start moving the needle toward more sustainable, inclusive business practice there. So I'll give the example of, I was speaking with a friend of mine recently who is working with NBC, the media company. And they were saying that, and, and she particularly works in the dietetics area. Um, and so she was saying that what's really fascinating is that when you just look at some of the food practices of NBC and, and some of what they have offered to their employees, they said, it's perfectly fine, but they, they had really innovative ideas around how NBC can actually just have more culturally sensitive, culturally inclusive food options. And rather than just having your, your very meat and potatoes type of food offerings, can we start you know, opening up some of our menus to have a different cultural type foods and, and really celebrating the diversity of our company at the same time, of course, we're doing the important work of actually increasing the diversity of our company. So it's just a very interesting food focused dietetic lens to impact and sustainability and inclusion in the workplace. And it's something that I would never think about. I'm not the person specially positioned to advocate for that, but it's something that she thought about and right away being in that space advocated for it. And now at least in her division of NBC, they actually are starting to take some of her recommendations, right? And so I think that's just a, a case in point example of how all of us, wherever we are, you may think that your industry or your particular position in the workplace is not the most impact focused, but I, I always take the alternative approach of what is it that you deem to be a gap where you are? And regardless of whether it's the, the most direct impact oriented position, I'm sure that there's some way that you can link it to impact if you're creative enough to think about it. And so um, I think that that's the first thing we can do is just really look in the mirror and say, what, where am I now and what can I do right where I am now to already start moving the needle? And then of course, if you find that you're disenchanted with where you are in the workplace or the broader surroundings and, and broader social uh, structures around you and you feel that you're not energized because you're not in the most direct impact oriented uh, place to make a difference then of course I, I, I always say that one thing you can do is right away start making those changes that put you in a position to be involved on the front lines of, of 
a, an important cause that you care about. So I believe strongly in volunteering. I think that there are a lot of really important volunteer-based organizations that need uh, human capital and, and talent. Uh, and so I would say right away, look in your community for who needs help and lend a hand. I think that's especially true in the era of COVID when a lot of volunteer-based organizations and nonprofits are doing digital work now. And so you can digitally volunteer for the organizations and the causes that you care about. That's another thing that we can do right now. I would also be remiss uh, if I didn't mention that we are on a call that's been sponsored by the Rutgers Institute for Corporate Social Innovation and Rutgers Business School. And these things take money. And so I'm a big believer that if you have the funds to, to spare, that I think that you know putting your money where your mouth is, so to speak, is another thing that you can do, uh, especially for causes that, that you believe in and that are giving you a value. So I was talking to a friend recently who said, you know, I listen to NPR every morning when I wake up. So he said, I'm a donor to NPR because it's enriched my life and made me a more intelligent and informed citizen. And I said, that's, that's great. That's, it's literally putting your money where your mouth is. So uh, again, thank you to Rutgers Business School and Rutgers uh, Institute for Corporate Social Innovation for, for putting this on. Um, and I just had to, had to put that out there is that's another thing that I think we can all do. Thank you. Thank you. Do it. Do it. Wherever you find yourself, do it. Kathleen. Completely agree with all of that. And I think the best place to start is with a question. Um, a question about why something is the way it is. And from there, you start figuring out how to answer that. And if it's a problem, then how to solve it. Um, that could be anywhere on a scale from, in my town's environmental commission, we were having an issue where we were getting applications for building projects that weren't very environmentally sustainable. We now have um, an ordinance that where they have to submit an environmental impact statement at Rutgers. There was the issue of student groups were kind of working on some similar projects and didn't really know that each other was working on similar projects. So we created together a sustainability coalition and that can just be magnified to in the chat, we have this question of how do we recover from COVID-19? How do we help people and our economy? A solution to that could be working towards a just green recovery in creating jobs in spaces where we can use these opportunities to solve the climate crisis while making opportunities for everyone. So asking questions, trying to answer it, and trying to figure out who's asking similar questions and get together no matter what field you're in, no matter what your skills are, and work together to try to solve that on any scale, on any level anything else. Thank you. Thank you, Jamila. We're getting close to the end here, folks. Yep. So um, one of the things that I, I say all the time is no um, kind of task or no action that we take is too small, right? So if we just like look at some of the um, SDG goals, like zero hunger, that's something that anyone could contribute to, right? They're hungry people, um, hungry students in school, right? There's um, if you look at just like in the Newark public school system, some of these kids don't eat after school hours, right? So they, they eat during school time and after school, they don't eat anymore. They, they even now they do their drop offs, they pick up their breakfast and their lunch and kind of that's it. And so something as simple as saying, you know, I want to organize a food drive for XYZ school in Newark and provide something like um, like a Chef Boyardee or like an easy mac and cheese with a drink and a snack. And that'll hold them over for the weekend. So I'm gonna pack it all up and, and kind of hand it over to the school so they could identify the students that in need and give it to them. That's something simple that anyone can do, right? If you look at um, quality education, right? So there are lots of students who are lagging because maybe they don't have the resources or their parents don't have the time to kind of sit with them and help them get their work done and get them to understand. Saying that you're going to volunteer at a school to try to help um, bridge those gaps. Those are small things that we could do to kind of push forward these um, sustainability initiatives and, you know, the SDG goals. So I think if we look around, there's something that we can do in every aspect of our lives. Um, even things that you, you don't think about. Pick getting a group of people together and saying, you know what, for my birthday, instead of having a party, let's go clean up the beach, right? And I'm gonna get everyone together and we're gonna go do that. 
all of that, all of those things are things that we can do ourselves without getting a big corporation or having a ton of money um, involved to, to, to get done. Thank you. Thank you. We really are coming to the end. So Joanna, not because I don't want to hear what you have to say, but because of time, briefly, what will you have to give us? Yeah, um, I could really sum it down to one word um, because everyone, you know, spoke so clearly about this. It's, it's really just organizing, um, you know, meeting the people that are going to work with you and organizing together um, to create change. It's really just as simple as that maybe, but, um, you know, as simple as that word, but maybe not as simple, but yeah, just find your allies. Excellent. What a great place to bring it home. Go ahead, Annalise. Uh, I really have to say the reason we're all here is for education. If people are more informed, they will make these educated decisions. And you have to link your education and what you know with your decisions that you're making. If you're going to be informed, that's great, but you have to go out and use what you know to make your decisions. As a consumer, you hold all the power of corporate America in your hands. So go out, support the companies that are green, and support everybody that's making the moves that you like to see. So that's like your strongest competitive edge you have in life. Thank you, folks. You've been absolutely fabulous. What a marvelous panel. Give them a strong round of applause, everyone, wherever you're sitting. Uh, I'll say one thing before we close. These folks are a fabulous resource and you should make use of them, all of you, okay? If you're using the Entergy app, you can send a message to each one of them. Do it while the Entergy app is still live so you're connected with them. I was thinking of putting their emails in the chat window, but that's too crass a way to do it. Let's do this elegantly through the app, right? Uh, send them a message so they can get back to you and you're connected and you can do all your questions and answers that way. Thank you so much everyone for coming to this session. Uh, thank you especially to our panel for a fabulous uh, exposition, and we will close this now. Thank you. Thank you so much. A fabulous panel, and I just want to make sure you all know about tomorrow. We're going to have a appreciative inquiry, which we were talking about earlier, uh, dialogue sessions with students to gather further input, but you set the stage magnificently, and I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much.